Welcome back to our lectures on stylistics. This lecture is being designed for the students of the Department of English and German Languages. The theme of this lecture is Interaction of different types of lexical meaning, zugma and pun, epithet and oxymoron. The outline of the lecture includes the following points. The first, interaction of primary and derivative logical meanings, within which we will consider pun and zugma. And the second, interaction of logical and emotive meanings, within which we'll discuss epithet, oxymoron, interjections and exclamatory words. In the previous lecture, we discussed the classification of lexical stylistic devices, and we started considering the first criterion, the interaction of different types of lexical meaning, exactly the first some point, primary dictionary and contextual imposed meanings. Today, we'll look at the interaction of primary and derivative logical meanings, and the interaction of logical and emotive meanings. As it is known, the word is, of all language units, the most sensitive to change. Its meaning gradually develops, and as a result of this development, new meanings appear alongside the primary one. It is normal for almost every word to acquire derivative meanings. Sometimes the primary meaning has to make way for quite a new meaning which ousts it completely. According to Galperin, there are special stylistic devices which make a word materialize distinct dictionary meanings. They are zygma and the pun. Zygma is the use of the word in the same grammatical but different semantic relations to two adjacent words in the context. The semantic relations being on the one hand literal and on the other transferred. For example, Dora, plunging at once into privileged intimacy and into the middle of the room. The pun is another stylistic device based on the interaction of two well-known meanings of a word or a phrase. The one reliable distinguishing feature between zygma and pun is a structural one. Zygma is the realization of two meanings with the help of a verb which is made to refer to different subjects or objects, direct and indirect. The pun is more independent. Like any stylistic device, it must depend on a context. But the context may be of a more expanded character, sometimes even as large as a whole work of emotive prose. Pun and zygma are semantically united into a small group as they have much in common both in the mechanism of their formation and in their function. They are quite pop popular in the stylistic tradition of the English-speaking countries. Their effect is humorous. Context leads to simultaneous realization of two meanings. The formation of pun may vary. One speaker's utterance may be wrong, interpreted, by the other. Due to the existence of different meaning of the misinterpreted word or its homonym. For example, have you been seeing any spirits or taking any? The first spirits refers to supernatural forces and the second one to strong drinks. Punning may be also the result of the speaker's intended violation of the listener's expectation. Here you can see some examples of pun, like nobody knows. The word knows, which means a part of the human face, is pronounced in the same way as the verb knows. Or, there are a lot of jokes based on pun such as, why are food parlors so cool? 
because they have so many fans. So the words cool and fans are used are polysemantic and here they can be used in the two different meanings and thus appears a joke. We deal with zugma when polysemantic verbs that can be combined with nouns of most variant semantic groups are deliberately used with two or more homogeneous members which are not connected semantically, as in such example. He took his hat and his leave. He felt perfectly capable of being in disgrace and in the gooseberry garden at the same time. The husband came home late, full of beer and guilt. Well, they have one uh, verb, like took, but the adjacent members, had and leave, are two, uh, two nouns which express different meanings. Had is something material, some object, which you can take into your hands, and leave, to take one's leave, means just to go away. And leave is an abstract noun here. Zygma is highly characteristic of English prose of previous centuries. Pun seems to be more varied and resembles zygma in its humorous effect only. Pun is based on the effect of deceived expectation, because unpredictability in it is expressed either in the appearance of the elements of the text unusual for the reader or in the unexpected reaction of the addressee of the dialogue. Pun in one of the most favored devices of Oscar Wilde. For instance, Lord Darlington, are nowadays we are all of us so hard up that the only pleasant things to pay are compliments. They are the only things we can pay. The next criterion for the classification of lexical stylistic devices is interaction of logical and emotive meanings. It must be clearly understood that the logical and the emotive are built into our minds and they are present there in different degrees when we think of various phenomena of objective reality. The ratio of the two elements is reflected in the composition of verbal chains, that is, in expression. We shall try to distinguish between elements of language which have emotive meaning in their semantic structure, and those which acquire this meaning in the context under the influence of a stylistic device or some other more expressive means in the utterance. Within this criteria, we will consider such stylistic devices as epithet, Within this group, we will consider such stylistic devices as epithet, oxymoron, and interjections. Epithet is a lexical stylistic device that relies on the foregrounding of the emotive meaning. The emotive meaning of the word is foregrounded to suppress the denotational meaning of the letter. The epithet is based on the interplay of emotive and logical meaning in an attributive word phrase, or even sentence, used to characterize an object and pointing out to the reader some of the properties or features of the object with the aim of giving an individual perception and evaluation of these features or properties. The characteristic attached to the object to qualify it is always chosen by the speaker himself. Epithet gives opportunities of qualifying every object from subjective viewpoint. 
which is indispensable in creative prose, publicist style, and everyday speech. From the point of view of their compositional structure, epithets may be divided into simple adjectives, nouns, participles. For instance, he looked at them in an animal panic. Compound, for instance, apple-faced man. The third, sentence and phrase epithets. For example, it is his do-it-yourself attitude. And the third, reversed epithets, composed of two nouns linked by an of phrase, a shadow of a smile. Like metatha, metonymy, and simile, epithets are also based on similarity between two objects, on nearness of the qualified object and on their comparison. Through long and repeated use, epithets become fixed. Semantically, there should be differentiated two main groups. The biggest one is affective epithets. These epithets serve to convey the emotional evaluation of the object by the speaker. Most of qualifying words found in the dictionary can be and are used as affective epithets. The second group is figurative epithets. The group is formed of metaphors, metonymies, and similes and expressed predominantly by adjectives. For instance, the smiling sun, the frowning cloud, qualitative adverbs, his triumphant look, or rarely by nouns in exclamatory sentences, you ostrich, and post-positive attributes, richer of the lion heart. An oxymoron is a lexical stylistic device that combines two normally contradictory terms. Oxymoron is a Greek word, oxy, which means sharp or pointed, and moros, dull. Thus, the word oxymoron is in itself an oxymoron. Its syntactic and semantic structures come to clashes. For example, coal, fire. The most common form of oxymoron involves an adjective-noun combination. For example, the following line from Tennyson's Idols of the King contains two oxymorons. And faith unfaithful kept him falsely true. The most widely known structure of oxymoron is attributive. But there are also others in which verbs are employed. Such verbal structures as to shout mutely or to cry silently are used to strengthen the idea. Often a writer will use an oxymoron in order to deliberately call attention to a contradiction. Some examples of deliberate oxymorons include deafening silence, forward retreat, accidentally on purpose, Little Big Man. Oxymorons are most telling employed and injecting a sense of ironic, ostensibly unintended humor. The effect is to confront the reader or the listener with a sense of ludicrous so as to render the whole sentence and the idea absurd and funny. Very often, the labeling of an expression as a perceived oxymoron is made on the basis of substituting an alternative, non-intended meaning for the meaning normally intended in the context of the expression in question. For instance, in the expression civil war, the term civil is normally intended to mean between citizens of the same state. In this sense, the expression is neither paradox nor self-contradictory. However, if civil is construed as non-military or reasonable and polite, the expression is a contradiction in terms. As one satirist said, the American Civil War was fought politely. 
Such designations of alleged oxymorons are often made with a humorous purpose. Alternatively, an oxymoron may occur when a word or phrase changes meaning. Few people today pay attention to the inherent contradiction in drinking from a plastic glass. The word glass is commonly used to refer to any cup from which one can drink. Originality and specificity of oxymoron becomes especially evident in non-attributive structures, which also, not infrequently, are used to express semantic contradiction, as in, the street was damaged by improvements, silence was louder than thunder. Oxymorons rarely become trite, for their components linked possibly repulse each other and oppose repeated use. There are few colloquial oxymorons. All of them show a high degree of the speaker's emotional Im involvement in the situation, as in the example, awfully pretty. Here you can see some other examples of oxymoron from literature. For instance, is Lady Armstrong at home? Jack asked with careful callousness by Charles Dickens. Well, heaven must be the hell of a place. Nothing but repentant sinners up there, isn't it? By Delany. Interjections and exclamatory words. Interjections are words we use when we express our feelings strongly and which may be said to exist in language as conventional symbols of human emotions. Interjection is a word with strong emotive meaning. They can express different emotions. Sadness, despair, joy, regret, fright, reproach, disgust, disapproval, astonishment, sarcasm, admiration, etc. One and the same interjection is apt to express different emotions. For example, the interjection oh by itself may express various feelings such as regret, despair, disappointment, sorrow, surprise, and many others. What are the examples of exclamatory words? Interjections such as heavens, good gracious, God knows, bless me, are exclamatory words generally used as interjections. It must be noted that some adjectives and adverbs can also take on the function of interjections, such as terrible, awfully, great, wonderful, splendid. These adjectives acquire strong emotional coloring and are equal in force to interjections. A greater or lesser volume of emotiveness may be distinguished in words which have emotive meaning in their semantic structure. And the most highly emotive words are words charged with emotive meaning to the extent that the logical meaning can hardly be registered. These are interjections and all kinds of exclamations. Here you can see examples of some common interjections and their meanings. For example, the interjection R expresses realization or acceptance, or the interjection bingo uh, expresses acknowledgement that something is right, or the interjection oops can be used when we make a mistake. This is all in brief concerning the content of this lecture. As a rule, you are suggested to answer these comprehension questions. To check if you have comprehended the content of the lecture properly. And as usual, you are offered 
a list of sources for your further reading. Thank you for attention. The lecture is over.